Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. We have a fantastic topic with terrific guests, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We have a fantastic topic. This is a topic that we've been working on for several years, but most intensely since, June, since uh, November of last year. The question is, how should academics respond to the emerging artificial intelligence technologies that we usually call generative AI? ChatGPT is in many ways the most famous or notorious, but we're also thinking of a lot of chatbots like Microsoft's Bing, Google's Bard, and also thinking of generative AI in the visual field where we have tools like DAL-E and Crayon and Midjourney, all of which let us make images. There's all kinds of issues. We have a whole bunch of sessions about this, and I've got a bunch of different experts I wanted to bring on stage today. And um, not in any particular order, uh, I want to start off with our really good friend uh, who's coming to us from late at night where he is, uh, Brent Anders, who is in the American University of Armenia. Um, so he's going to be coming to us, and it's probably almost time for bed for him. So I'm really grateful for him to join us. Good evening, yes, sir. yeah, it's, it's definitely pretty late over here, but that's okay. This is uh, for a good cause. So well, it is. Yes. Well, I'm so glad you made time for us. Brent, you know um, how we how guests introduce themselves in the forum. Uh, they explain what they're going to be working on for the rest of the year. And I, I suspect you're going to say something about working on AI. So why don't you tell us? What are you going to be working on? Right. So, um, so my position at the university, I work at the university, the American University of Armenia. And I'm the director of institutional research and assessment, as well as we, we house the Center for Teaching and Learning. So... One of the big things we're doing is trying to push this information to all of our instructors, as well as making it just available online to everybody, different things to do associated with how to implement AI like ChatGPT. Mm. So because of that, because of pushing that information and because of being on forums like this, there's been lots and lots of calls by other universities around the world. So I've been very busy with different webinars and uh, as far as what I'm going to be busy with, I have a huge workshop that I'm doing. It's a month long workshop for a uh, university in Jamaica, Myco University in Jamaica. Nice. So that's going to take up a, a whole month. Um, and then at the end of uh, June, I'll be going to Tunisia, uh, the university over there. They really want to have a hands on workshop. So I'll be live in person there oh, because th there's lots, lots of people that want to physically go through and okay how exactly can i implement this yeah. you know i teach writing how can i use it here what if i want to block it what if i so there's so many different questions there's mm. such a, a thirst for mm. knowledge so i'm going to be very busy this summer for sure um the so. other big thing big news is um i have a book coming out next week so i'm very excited about that because it is what i think is the fundamental issue and that's ai literacy mm. so yeah, so the book will be coming out next week. I'm going to push that out through Twitter and as many people as I can tell because there's been so much call for this. It's going to be called uh, the AI Imperative, Empowering Instructors mm. and Students. So the idea with this is that this is the key concept. This is the key area, the key skill, and it's actually more than a skill because it's kind of a social construct that we have to start yeah. thinking in a different way. So that book is going to be coming out. It's, I'm going to push that out. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So I thank you for the opportunity for me to, to share that because I think that's going to be the critical thing that all institutions will now have to address because of the way that AI is being so integrated with everything. If you don't have critical understanding of the AI literacy components to it, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to use it effectively and you're going to be influenced in a way that you're not even thinking about. So I see that as being an exciting future. Well, you're going to be front and center on this, uh, my friend. That's terrific. Uh, do you have a link to the book, uh, to a catalog page or a download page? Not yet. It's, uh, it's Everything is coming soon, so okay, next wait. week. Yeah. Let me know so I can brag about it to the whole world. Great, yeah. Um, well, let me, let me add uh, another friend to the stage uh, to make sure that uh, we can have um, a wide-ranging discussion. And this is uh, our dear friend, Ruben Punta Dura. Um, Ruben and I are sometimes um, seen as doppelgangers, which is really unfortunate because uh, Ruben, for me, always brings good things, whereas doppelgangers are usually bad. Um, and Ruben, you're coming to us from what looks like an alien world. 
Yes, this is uh, another one of my AI experiments in generating ideas about learning spaces uh, in the context of climate crises and in the context of sustainability and so on. So this is yet another experiment. And so what could you do with a library if you suddenly had to think about it uh, with you know a very different uh, climate environment and it had to be resilient in that context? So. Very nice. That's that's what. So I'm, I'm coming from an experiment, if you will. Well, and as 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 are we all, I think. And uh, friends, um, uh, I like to brag uh, to my students uh, that Ruben is a friend because my students are enthralled and well so by his Samer methodology. Um, but I wanted to ask you, looking ahead, Ruben, what are you going to be working on for the rest of the year? Are you also going to be uh, focusing on AI and education? That's definitely one of the key areas of focus. So one of the areas for me is AI and education, both saying, okay, so how do we leverage the tools? And in particular, in the context of SAM or some of the results that have already been coming out in terms of how AI plays in the context of SAM or in terms of how you use SAM to think about the applications of AI, as well as specific areas of application of AI that can be leveraged, that we say, for maximum effect. So that's definitely one area. But another area for me is going to be uh, the question of how do you develop new forms of AI or forms of AI that are better suited, differently suited to different tasks and so on. And with the advent now of uh, GPT-like, uh, you know, Libre tools that allow you to take the tool, run it locally, modify it, uh, be actually able to see what you use to train the tool, train it using what you want. That's going to be a very active area of research for me. And the third area that I think I'm going to highlight in this context is the area of what I call the side effects or, uh, you know, where, where do you start to get things when AI enters the picture that are not the obvious things? You know, people, some people are very focused on the very obvious things. So will my AI say very nasty things about somebody? Will it generate, you know, known false information? But sometimes, uh, to me, some of the most interesting and at the same time, some of the most challenging, both challenge, uh, you know, difficulties, but also opportunities arise when you start to look at what happens when AI enters the world of work. What happens when AI enters the world of accessibility, mm -hmm. availability of information mm -hmm. in ways that you might not have predicted? You know, what happens when, for instance, places where you used to have certain types of friction in information, the friction goes away because of general availability of AI as a way to access, process that information. What type of side effects do you get? And some of the side effects can be good and some of them can be, you know, really quite difficult to deal with. So that's a third area for me. Mm, mm. Those all sound awesome. And uh, I, I, I have a feeling that um, Somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, perhaps close to the Azores, uh, Brent and Ruben, you, you both will coincide and, uh, uh, and, and really uh, have things rocking and rolling with this. Uh, friends, if you're, if you're new to the forum, uh, I'm going to ask our, our two kind guests a couple of questions, um, and then they're going to probably explode and cut loose and, and, and have all kinds of ideas. But the, the project here is for me to get out of the way and to get all of your questions and comments going. And I can see in the chat already there's a whole stream of comments, which is great. I'm going to try and bring those in. But please use the Q&A box to throw in questions so that I can share them well with everybody. And if you want to join us on stage, um, you, can, uh, you can please join us at any time. Uh, we're grateful to see you. Um, one question that came in uh, already is from our good friend Don Shawless. Uh, and this is a kind of big picture question I'd like to start with. Um, he's been using the term robo colleges um, to talk about what he sees as a kind of dystopian future. Uh, and this is one where uh, faculty jobs are de skilled and increasingly replaced by AI plus other forms of data. Uh, and the question he had was, um, can you imagine such a fully automated robo college uh, where all the instructional work is being done entirely by software? Is that something that we should anticipate? Um, I'll, I'll go first because this is right on top of my mind because uh, towards the end of the book that I'm writing, I have a section there all about predictions, right? So it, this makes sense. So the, my answer is yes very much. We need to be thinking about that. And the way that I envision it happening is that there's going to be plenty of low-level courses that 
yeah, it'll make a lot of sense to have this system be used for a lot of those things. So that means that it's a low level course, meaning that, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't require that much uh, additional guidance from an instructor. The, the AI, like advanced chat GPT, will be able to uh, address all of these things. It'll be able to assist in the, in the process, not just in, hey, here's information. Now let me test you on it. But yeah. we're talking more in depth, like guiding, like conversations, like asking you questions in a conversational way. What are your thoughts about this? So that whole thing, I think, will be starting to get replicated. And I see it in place first in low level classes. Then what I see is, you know, a little bit further down, I see where there's going to be university. There's going to be this big distinction in that you'll have universities that are less funded. They have way more robo courses like what you're talking about. They'll have way more of those courses. And then universities, Ivy League or more well-funded, well, they have more instructors. And so now the view is going to be that, oh, that's a luxury. That's a privilege to have. You had a, you had a real life instructor. You had a real mm -hmm. professor mm -hmm. that was teaching this. Oh, did you go to an Ivy League school? You know, so it's going to be that type of thing where it's going to be viewed as a special thing, an enhanced thing. Now, the big thing that I talk about in my in my book with this is so all of us need to be really be thinking about that. Right. As far as maybe not the near, near future, but the coming up future, I say within a decade in that because of this, we need to be thinking, OK, well, what type of instructor would be the ones that stay the ones that offer the most benefit, not just the ones that are mm -hmm. subject matter experts, because, again, we're not gatekeepers of knowledge anymore because there's so much knowledge available through the AI. Now it's going to be, to be a subject matter expert, but what's going to be even more of a premium is, am I enthusiastic when I give my instruction? Am I able to captivate? Am I able to motivate my students? Am I able to create this environment within the class where we have a, this you know, community of inquiry? So am I giving that added value of students physically being there? Otherwise, why not take a robo course, right? So that's going to be the big difference I see. And those are the specific skills that instructors will need to maximize in order to be the most competitive uh, going forward. And a, a prime example of this is just to look at what Khan Academy is doing. Uh, they recently released a, a TED Talk, and he showed some, I mean, unbelievable stuff where it's conversational tone. It's a tutor right now. It's just an advanced AI Khan tutor. I think they call it Amigo uh, AI, mm -hmm. but the idea there is that it's GPT-4, but with additional processing so that it can do all sorts of additional things. That'd be a prime example of looking at it to see where the near future is going to be headed. Just a, a quick note. First of all, thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, just a quick note from what you're talking about. Link, uh, there's a comment in the chat from Shelby Rosengarten, who I believe is in Florida. Shelby, I wonder if your state's governor would actually be considering this for uh, political purposes. Uh, it's a str stray note. Brent, that's terrific. Thank you. Ruben, why don't you, what, what do you think? Um, Don's vision of the Robo College. I, I'll admit that I'm a little bit less enthusiastic about the Robo College. Here's why. We can do it. I mean, if you're asking me technically, is it possible for a tool a la GPT-4 with some tweaks, modifications, et cetera, to do what some people are describing as Robo College? Sure. That's not the issue. But my question is why? Why do we want to settle for Robo College in that perspective? We have right now the tool the capacity, the frameworks to go well beyond this. So I'm, I'll am i be honest with you. In other words, I was also looking in the chat and the question of, well, is it the, the introductory courses mm -hmm. or is it the high school? I'm saying, let's take a step back because that's going to happen. Okay, Sal Khan has already put it out there and we're going to see things like that. That's not the question. That's not the issue. But right now, my thinking is more along the lines of, can we use this? to take a different approach? Can we use this to increase student agency? Can we use this to increase learner agency, all ages, okay? I, I don't wanna make this just about high school or college, mm -hmm. traditional, or any age, any group. Can we increase agency? Can we increase engagement? So for instance, I look at this and I say, look, with this tool set, I can think of ways of constructing learning 
that allow me to learn using AI, learning alongside AI in ways that I could not before. So mm. GPT tools, absolutely, mm. we're talking about using them. But as, the, as in that vision of the is the instructor that is a little wiser about what the student doesn't know and so on, and we still do Calc 1 and uh, Physics 1 and Lit 1, et cetera, just with the robot, that to me is less intriguing, less interesting than to say, let's take a step back. Let's look at the challenges that we're looking at. And let's look at the really difficult and interesting and problems that need our attention right now. How do we think about the learning differently using the AI? You know, mm-hmm. to me, there's an exact, there are, it's not the first time this has happened. I say, look, you've always been using a technology, you know, for many, many years, longer than you've had computers around the place. It's called the book. And the book is a technology and libraries are machines and colleges and libraries are machines. Unfortunately, at some point, some of that perspective has been lost and to say, well, okay, these machines make certain forms of thinking, learning, creation possible. Well, let's take a step back and let's think about what AI can do for us, because I think that's where the real potential lies. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that we're going to see the Khan Academy, uh, GPTIs, etc. but I'd hate for us to get stuck there. My, my engagement is when people ask me, well, so what do you want to see? I'll be honest with you. When people say, for instance, so uh, do you want to see the kindergartner pick up their book and read facets of? Yes, but I don't want the kindergartner to just be doing that. I want that kindergartner to have real agency in the community in which they live. That kindergartner to be able to work side by side with somebody who's in their late 90s and also say, mm-hmm. hey, that person also has real agency mm-hmm. and use the tool to build out the agency. In other words, it goes to a different notion. Let's say, I'm saying, let's take the opportunity to really think about education in new ways, in deeply new ways. Thank using you. The tool set. Thank you. Um, you two are both brilliant. Thank you. Um, the, there, you can see this is this is an enormously, enormously deep. Uh, subject with a wide, wide range of roots and implications. Um, this is going in a lot of great directions. I, w- I want to thank you and both. And I also want to bring up, if I can, a couple of questions that have come up in response to your comments right away. Um, and uh, again, Don, uh, thank you for the really good question. Uh, Phil Lingard uh, is coming to us, I think, from Britain. Uh, Phil asks this question. Uh, Robo colleges will be invaluable in Africa, where the demand for education completely outstrips the availability of qualified people capable of being academic instructors. That's not a question per se. That's a that's a comment. But I'm I'm wondering what what the two of you think about that. Here, I'll I'll put it back up so you can see it again. Yeah, it, it, that that's just the thing. Like you know, the it, it's it's one of those things. Like yeah, I have enthusiasm for it because I see so much possibility. But uh, you know, I don't. I, I don't negate anything that will, of what you just said, because it, and it's definitely going to be that that way. In that, I see a disparity occurring as far as I. I mean, to be honest, I really think there's going to be a completely robo college at some point where it's going to be 100 percent automated. That isn't necessarily great because I see so much value in the social aspect of the learning with other human beings. I mean, I, I very much value the idea of of AI plus HI, right? Uh, so that human intelligence working together. So definitely I'm all for that. But even with this disparity, it's a now let's look at it in a different way. The disparity is actually a, a different thing in that there is no disparity if we didn't have access before and now we have all this access. And we're also trying to do this whole idea of there's plenty of people that want to have college, but they won't be able to go to college because they have a full-time job. They have all these other things. But if they're able to use an AI system to go through the coursework where it's 100% tailored around them and what they're doing, wow, that's very powerful. Talk about agency that they're taking. Uh, that's, the, that's the other big thing that I talk about when I, whenever I talk about AI. You know, I focus very much on the instructor, but then I flip it on them And I say, think about the empowerment that's happening now with the student, because now they can learn anything through the AI. 
the instructor is still super important to be able to clarify, to be able to help them understand better examples, the social aspect. You know, I'm all about this whole idea of experiential learning cycle. You know, we need to discuss, we need to uh, talk about it, bounce ideas off of each other. So that's important right there. But there's just so much that happens with that student. And plus, one of the big things that we're supposed to be doing in higher education is teaching our students to be lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. Wow, the empowerment that now happens with AI and that they can fully be lifelong learners at any time, at any place. So to me, I see that as a big, powerful aspect of this, even though there's going to be some of these differences that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Ruben, did you want to uh, jump on that or? No, I, and again, I, I do keep coming back to some of the questions we need, we need to get into a more specific, you know, scenario by scenario context, you know, because one of the key elements of some of the scenarios is, is well, what, what do the people who live there, who, you know, who would be, so we say, using the resources, etc., what would they like, what would they want, what would they need? To learn use and in some of the cases what we've seen is mismatches between structures that have been the gateways for lack of a better word to learning as opposed to what works what you know what i'm sorry i i do t tend to tend to use the term agency once again what brings agency to people on the ground so i do keep coming back though i, I have absolutely no quarrel with the fact that AI can make access to knowledge, to knowledge in certain forms and central in certain contexts available. So I have no quarrel with that being a useful application of it. I mean, I use it myself in that sense. It's no different than any other technology you might use. But I do keep coming back to my concern is more when we design the whole model around mm -hmm. that rather than around the opening up of new possibilities. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chat is just on fire right now. There's a, there's a ton of comments going back and forth, and I'm just staggered by um, the. There's a reference to a famous 19th century political economic debate. Um, that's a sign of just how wonderful uh, all of you guys are as a community. There's a, but there's a related question, um, and and this is from uh, our friend Glenn McGee in Florida, who um, who asks who, who takes Don's idea and your responses and takes it in a in a broader direction. Uh, what extent is, and this is for you, Ruben, but I think uh, Brent, you can answer as well. To what extent does AI weaponize the class conflict in the classroom, the power struggle between teachers and pupils? <laughs> oh boy, uh, huge, huge question, Glenn. And, and thank you for bringing it up. Uh, the dynamics start shifting rather dramatically, and this is something nothing new, of course. Uh, we've seen shifts in dynamics with all sorts of ranges of tools. Uh, but again, I, I think this is the point at which you start to take a step, uh, take a step towards thinking, well, okay, so if you're looking at the power dynamics in the classroom, what has generated those power dynamics? And in what sense does the introduction of AI shift the balance of those power dynamics? What is the interest by all parties involved in shifting those power dynamics and why? And the way it, the short answer would be that it certainly makes the power dynamics completely uh, not tenable in any of the standard forms that you see right now, longer term. I, I honestly don't think that's you know, sustainable. But how it plays out in the longer picture also has a lot to do with the image of education that you have, the goals of education, the goals of learning, and the different roles that people play in this context. I mean, I'd be happy to get into a you know longer conversation about you know what this can look like and we get into questions like the goals of education and so on but the short answer is that it is profoundly destabilizing to the existing dynamics and then it requires as part of the process a re-engagement with the idea behind those dynamics so right excellent Excellent, and I, I, yeah. I hope I hope yeah. Glenn likes this because uh, Glenn is a is a is a huge sociology is his main stru structure mm -hmm. for interpreting the world. So I think he'll appreciate that. But Brent, did you want to say something more to that too? I, I was just going to say, you know, that the, so there's different sort of levels of that because it's it's very multifaceted. But even at the sort of the the micro level of that, you you definitely have it right now. I've seen it everywhere as far as instructors and the whole aspect of 
well, whatever I assign them, they can use ChatGPT, right? So that already is sort of, well, now the students have more power. But again, it's the aspect of, okay, but you have to work with the assignments in the right way. Uh, the, the change that ChatGPT and other AIs are, are affecting AI or affecting higher education is that it's improving it because now most of those assignments could have already been cheated on before, right? We had the internet, we had, we had uh, uh, essay mills, those all existed. Uh, it's yes. funny, I had this uh, conversation with a bunch of new instructors. So these were all new instructors. I had a focus group with them and I asked them, I was asking them questions about all sorts of things, their experience, the facilities at the university, uh, prior training. I had so many different questions for him. No matter what question I asked, no matter what topic, it always came back to ChatGPT. They mm -hmm. always brought it back to ChatGPT mm -hmm. because that was such a power dynamic. So the idea mm -hmm. there is that they need to have better understanding. They need to understand the way that they're doing the assessments. It can't just be this big assessment at the end because then it's all the focus is just on, well, what's that end product? That's not how good education is supposed to work. With course alignment, you're supposed to have formative assessments throughout where you can gauge their understanding and learning through that process. And you need to hold students accountable. So I'm not really holding a student accountable if I'm just asking for a product at the end. If throughout the mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. I'm engaging mm -hmm. with them, I'm asking them, they're having to produce in class or having to present in class or having to be able to back up what they're doing. That's the important part. So the agency, the... The, the power dynamics, you know, it's in a micro, micro aspect, but then again, there's many different layers in how you formulate the course and mm. you know, access and all these other things. So, yeah, it is complicated, but there's many different levels that we can work on. Well, you have um, you have two fans now, Brent. Uh, one is me and uh, also uh, Amy McPherson in chat just says, go, Brent. My instructional designer self loves what you're doing. Um, <laughs> and and this isn't enough, friends. This is uh, we um, having these two geniuses on stage is just not sufficient. We need this problem is so huge. We need to add more. And uh, I'm actually delighted to bring in our surprise guest uh, coming to us from uh, Egypt is uh, Maha Bali, um, who has been on the program before. And Maha has all kinds of thoughts. Hello, Maha, and thank you for joining Hi. us late in the day. Thanks for having me, Brian. So good Pleasure. to see you both as well. A pleasure, a pleasure. Good to meet you, Maha. Um, I, I was wondering, Maha, this is this is just a supposition, and tell me if I'm wrong here, mm -hmm. but I think you're interested in talking about how to support faculty in AI, um, and, yeah, and, and and partly in and in, in multiple levels. Uh, there's the the fact of psychological, physical, fiscal, emotional drain that faculty mm -hmm. have been facing for the past few years. Uh, and then there's also the sheer complexity of this subject. As you've seen from our half hour of discussion we've had so far, Brent, mm -hmm. Ruben, everybody has been telling all kinds of implications of this. And I'm wondering if, if I could just ask you to start talking about this. How do you see all of academia best supporting faculty in this age of generative AI? Okay, so thanks for that very difficult question that I was asking also rather than wanting to answer. Question. But... <laughs> well, we can go to your question so first, first if you like. Let me, let me pick up on, on two things that uh, Brent and Ruben said that I liked. So I really liked Ruben's emphasis on agency, and I'm not really sure why someone thinks there's a fallacy there. I don't care about that. I think emphasizing agency is important <laughs> and nurturing student agency. And there's a lot of ways in the past and in the current situation where AI can interrupt agency or or trick people into feeling they're getting agency, but they aren't. So it's really important to be very mindful of that for both faculty and students. And I really liked what um, Brent, very nice to see you after all the Twitter combos, that this emphasis on, you know, how do we redesign assessments? It's not about what AI can do. It's about how can we make meaningful assessments, right? So the first thing I was saying is, uh, in the question that I posted is, faculty are already burnt out from the pandemic and from being asked to redesign their assessments and rethink the way they teach for a couple of years when we were fully online and then coming back, oh, let's do hybrid. So try to focus with two people, two places at the same time. And so they're already pretty burnt out with this. And then honestly, Brent, the kind of discourse around the robo university is, is really not good for anybody's well-being. So <laughs> for faculty to feel like, it's, it's like what happened in 2012 with MOOCs. Oh, universities are not gonna exist anymore. That did not happen. I do not think that this is what's going to happen with AI. What I think is going to happen is, yeah, a slight shift in what education needs to be. So what you were saying towards the end, 
like let's redo our rethink our assessments let's rethink what we need to do because some of the basics can be done mm -hmm. with ai the thing is i think a lot of times um if you look really, really closely at what ChatGPT brings out, I'm going to give the cake metaphor that I used on it in, in um, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. If some of you saw that, mm -hmm. so I was saying, cake, making a cake, you can make it from scratch or from a box. You can buy it ready baked, or you can buy a Twinkie, which is like a you know factory made. All of them look the same. And honestly, a lot of what ChatGPT produces, if you don't know how to prompt it very well, is like a Twinkie. It's very basic and bland and not unique and does not have personality, but you can learn to use it better. And there are a lot of other AIs I was saying in the chat that, that do the search and help. And we need to think about how are these things gonna help certain students, especially those who are, for example, non-native speakers of a language and a reading is difficult for them, but there's AI that can help summarize the reading or write it out for them in a way that's more accessible to them. And how can that help us in education? Um, how, can, how can we make sure that students are using AI in the right time of the process? But also, what are the emotional aspects of the whole learning process that I don't like with effective AI? I think there's a huge difference between being cared for by a human being and being cared for by a machine. And I think we all need the human being and that education is not just a cognitive thing, right? A lot of times when we talk about MOOCs or AI, we're talking about a cognitive thing. Yes, you could potentially use AI for mental health therapy. I am sure it doesn't do mm -hmm. a great as great a job as a human and i'm sure human beings mess up as well mm -hmm. but when human beings mess up they can they can fix that you can find another human being to fix it right um i think you know the a lot of this talk is a little exaggerated for the moment there's a lot of ai that does really 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 useful work in the world like talking about climate change i met someone who'd done ai that could detect forest fires as soon as they start so you can stop them that's useful ai that's really, really useful AI because you don't want a human being to put themselves at risk and be there in that spot. And you can't possibly probably even do it. Mm. But with, um, with what we can do with, with the text generator AI and with faculty, the, the, the issues I'm facing right now with someone who works at a center for learning and teaching is there are some people who are willing to come in and try the AI. And the best people, the, you know, the people who are in a good place right now are the ones who have tried it. They know its capabilities. They can intuitively see if students are using it and they're integrating it into their classes to experiment, to learn from students because students use it in ways differently than what we expected them to do. But not everyone has that energy. And asking them to redo their assignments is what we're trying to help them do. But that's also a lot of effort. And I think it's really important to figure something out. I don't have an answer right now, uh, but I really don't think we should be making them feel like the, the, the AI is gonna replace them at the moment. I think we can push them definitely. How can you make your assessment more meaningful? How can you motivate students? Mm. And, and also, which aspects of what you teach can be taken from a box? Does it really need to be completely baked from scratch? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does, mm -hmm. but sometimes it doesn't. And mm -hmm. the other thing, a lot of learning is happening, should be happening outside the written moments, right? If you teach engineering, or if you teach sociology, your students should be going out into the world and doing physical things that cannot be done with AI, or maybe they can be helpful with AI, but there's actual work. Like if you're doing actual community-based learning and helping an actual community solve a problem, or you're in a lab and you're doing an experiment that will really show you something physically improved by your work. And then if, if writing it with AI produces something accurate, that's fine. A lot of times it won't be accurate, but if it can, that's not a problem. So that's kind of where I'm trying to, to get faculty's head up. You know, if you can't experiment with it, if writing is not the thing that you're teaching, Focus on what students really need to learn to do in the new, in the real world, mm -hmm. and also talk to people in industry, and find out what they want from your students. Because sometimes they do want them to learn AI, and sometimes they want them to be able to do things from scratch as well. And it depends on the field. Very well, nuanced conversation. Well, Mahab, thank you so much. Um, I mean, this is this is terrific. Um, hearing so much from you on this. Um, I, when when people talk about making food from scratch, I often think about a baker I knew who actually bought an acre of land in order to raise grain uh, from scratch in order to mill it and turn it into wheat. Um, and, and that's extreme. Most people haven't done that. Um, but, you know, so it, where scratch comes, it's, it's an interesting setting. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions. Maha, can I keep you on stage for a bit? To... Excellent. Excellent. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions. I don't think we can get to all of them, but I want to try and pick out the ones that are really, really uh, telling. Um, here's a, a, a very thoughtful question. Um, and this is from Kate Herzog, a librarian. He says, do you see AI as having the ability to provide Socratic questioning? It does a little bit. You can try it. 
It's not great. I, I've tried the whole using it as a tutor and give me Mm feedback and stuff. It's not bad. I think if I asked it on like very advanced PhD level stuff, it wouldn't be able, but like on first year level type of things, it does okay. What about now? I don't know, Brent, you've probably like in Ruben, you've probably experienced. Yeah, I mean, so there's different tools, especially with uh, the more advanced um, uh, chat GPT plus. I tend to focus, I try to focus mainly on the free version of chat GPT just to, so that, you know, the mm. maximum amount of people to have access to it, mm. uh, even with that. And Brian, you, you know about this too. You can use it in so many different ways as far as creating simulation, uh, creating built-in games, creating the, this whole aspect of it's going to ask mm -hmm. you questions. It's going to have you go through a process. So yes, I think it can be used in a lot of different ways, but again, I mean, I, I'm definitely not trying to hold anyone back or put anyone down in any way. Uh, I'm just trying to be sort of future thinking in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I suffered through COVID as well, and it was very draining. It was very hard. But I always try to take the approach that I'm looking at things both as an instructor as well as a student. Right. Because I had great experience as a student and I had very negative experiences as a student, mm -hmm. both online and face to face. So the thing is, yeah, I have instructors that are full on wanting to learn more about ChatGPT, but I have plenty of instructors who are burnt out. I understand that, but they don't want to hear about ChatGPT. And to me, mm. okay, I understand you're burnt out and I want to assist as much as possible. But now I get upset because now, guess what? You're doing a disservice to the student. Now mm. you're not properly helping the student. And so what I tell instructors, because we had a big issue here with uh, the whole aspect of AI detection and mm -hmm. um, you know, plagiarism and all that. And so one of the big things is that I'm always about uh, instructor agency and that they have control. They're deciding when to use ChatGPT, when not to, not the, not the student. So they're having to be able to, but the big thing I tell them is that within your course, you should always be directly telling the student Hey, for this assignment, we're not using ChatGPT. We're not using AI. For this assignment, we will. For this assignment, I'm trying to build skills mastery here. So in the future, we're going to use it for this other assignment. Now, what I really push for the instructor is that, hey, for every assignment, tell the student whether they can or can't use it. Because students are going to start to push more and more, why can't I use this? Mm -hmm. Why can't I use my AI? I have ChatGPT on my phone. So it's a part of me because I always have my phone with me. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're mm -hmm. saying I can't use chat GPT, I can't use my AI, I don't think that's fair. That's what a student is going to start to say because yeah. it's going to be so integrated into everything. It's going to be fully integrated into your word processor, fully integrated into Adobe, any type of web page you go to, any type of app. So it's going to be this whole thing of the student. I really see the student starting to develop this idea of, it's a given that AI is used for everything. Mm -hmm. So yep. again, that's the thing is that, uh, you know, and I, again, I fully understand that the whole aspect of us, you know, not wanting to change yet again, but we need to at least be prepared to answer mm -hmm. that student and be able to say exactly why we're not using AI for this one. Because in order for you to be able to be a good engineer, you have to know this concept here. So you can't use ChatGPT for this because you're going to have to use it over here where you can use ChatGPT or another AI, but you have to develop this here. So there's going to be a mixture of these things. So it needs to be really well thought out uh, on different yeah. levels. Yeah, you're right. And that students are indeed saying that. And mm. the, the funnier thing is that students are using Quillbot and not counting that as AI. Right. <laughs> they're like, oh, that's just open all the time. It's kind of like that happens to my text. I didn't, yeah. I didn't mm -hmm. like to, mm -hmm. there's no agency here. It's just, mm -hmm. it's transparent to them that they're using Quillbot. They're not counting that as, as part of the AI process. I think you're right in taking that time to explain. But then the faculty actually really need to have a little bit of AI literacy to be able to tell them that. AI still. literacy. Yep. They think, yes. I think the, the other element of this that we haven't talked about, and I know Brian uh, knows about this and we talked about it, is like, it has the training the data sets that ChatGPT has been trained on mm. does not have a lot of uh, knowledge from my part of the world. I'm in Egypt, right? And so my part of the world, not just the Arabic language text that it brings out, it's fluent in Arabic, but it's thinking is like a Western person speaking in Arabic. Mm. And it's knowledge about my part of the world really messed up. So whatever level of accuracy you can get on a hundred level psychology course on ChatGPT, 
it doesn't have that about any knowledge about my part of the world and it hallucinates like crazy mm. on that so that is really frustrating to see or good i'm not sure but i kind of feel like i'm a computer scientist originally my undergraduate work was a neural network i know how machine learning works i know they could have trained it better i know they mm -hmm. could have allowed users to train it and they haven't done it that way they've done it where it learns from what they gave it partially to try to prevent it from doing bad things but why why is it con continually treated that way why they were someone was talking about the visual ai smiling like an american smile why does visual ai create people who smile that way like there's there's a lot of hegemonic knowledge built into it. Maha, this is this is terrific, and 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 Brett, both of you, this these are these are really really deep answers to this question. Again, this is we're doing a high a high wire high speed uh, graduate seminar on this topic right now. Um, I I want if I could, Maha, something you said reminds me of something that Ruben wanted to talk about, and I want to throw to that. But before I get to that, just a couple of quick notes. First of all, everybody in the chat. Do you mind if I post the chat to my blog anonymized? Um, this is already in an unbelievably rich chat. Uh, so please just let me know in the chat if you don't want me to use it. Um, I also want to, uh, in the spirit of uh, Brent's comment about the stuff is already there. We have to, you know, it, we can't resist it in that sense of not using it. Um, in the chat, I just put a link to an article this morning from a wonderful librarian, Barbara Fister who makes an interesting comparison between ChatGPT and Wikipedia, uh, which I strongly recommend. It's a great introduction to ChatGPT and also uh, some wonderful stuff there. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the um, approvals. Uh, Maha was talking about uh, training um, data sets. And Ruben, I know you're really keen on getting away from the giant proprietary corporate black box data sets and, uh, and tools right now. Um, do we have options in the uh, DIY and open and Libra worlds? Yes. The, the short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, we do. Uh, so here's where things are at right now. We've had some tools have been developed in varying forms of Libra from scratch. For instance, Bloom, which is a EU project, hmm. has been developed from that. And that's already showing, it has shown promise. There have been some issues with Bloom. It's a very big uh, model if you're going to deal with some aspects of it. But there have been in recent days some really exciting developments. So what happened is Meta released uh, one of its tools, Llama, as uh, quasi, it is open source with some restrictions on it and so on. Stanford took it and they made uh, Alpaca and Alpaca was a small scale model, still is, exists. you can uh, download it and use it, but it started to show the way towards a model that you could train rapidly and efficiently and actually run on something that doesn't require super, super computers to run. Hmm. Vicuña has been a derivative of that model and now we have stable Vicuña, which uh, about four days ago, it was released in a 13 billion parameter version. And the beauty of all of these models, and this is just the beginning, okay? You're seeing an explosion of these is that all of them have at least a couple of key features. Number one, you can actually see the code. It's, it, you can play with it. There may be restrictions. Usually the restrictions are on commercial, not on non-commercial use. And even the commercial ones are negotiable, so to speak. And, but the second thing, which goes to what Maha was pointing out, absolutely correct that the training models that have been used for many of the you know, well-known engines you know, speak, have very serious limitations and speak very little to parts of the world other than parts of the US and the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these can also be trained. And what we're seeing is the cost and difficulty of training is plummeting. And I really mean mm. plummeting. Mm. We're going from, you know, you need a stable of super, super computers that only a few companies in the world have to, well, you can do it if you can purchase enough AWS uh, time to, you can do it for about 600 bucks to now we're around $200 to do a complete training from scratch wow. of one of these. So we are really rapidly converging on a whole new generation. And the beauty of this generation is we can make it into what we want it to be. With, of course, uh, the constraints of, okay, this is how the engine works. Large language models have some constraints in, to, in terms of what they can, cannot do, how they appear, etc. Maha, you mentioned your background in computer science, so you know very well, indeed, uh, the limitations of this as well. 
Uh, so the, there are, of course, many things, but there are also opportunities. And I want to encourage as many people as possible to start getting your hands into this. Uh, would I use these days a stable Vicuña 13 billion uh, to teach a course? Probably not. It's impressive, but there are instabilities. There are places where I'm scratching my hand saying, what went wrong there, etc. On the other hand, I can actually train it in some ways. I can say, this is a body of knowledge I'd like my students and I to explore jointly. Yeah. I'm going to train the engine on this. So it's not just spouting whatever hallucination it thought it, you know, it, it came from its, you know, it did so many random hops and then it went off way into wild yonder, right? That's what hallucination is. It's a result of the, you know, taking one step too far down that random path walk. Uh, but instead say, no, this is focused on this body of knowledge or this context or this perspective. And this opens it up. Again, this is, early days still, but these are exciting early days. I'm not talking about the type of thing where I can say a decade from now or two decades from now, we'll be able to do this. I'm saying right now, you can actually start playing with some of these models online on your systems and really explore alternatives here. And I think, again, would I ask somebody who hasn't ever done this to just do this and immediately use it in the class? No. Is it somewhere where I would encourage people to explore and to start the process of thinking and building out? Absolutely, yeah. yes. So perhaps we should anticipate something like a uh, maybe a library-driven um, or a consortium-driven or a nonprofit like Internet Archive on um, doing something where the data set is much better. Perhaps, I'm just making this up, perhaps entirely trained on .edu domain content perhaps entirely on CC license content. Um, but then the second wave after that will be having students and faculty doing this. See, that, that's, that's just it, Brian. Like, I, I, to me, I'm still amazed that there isn't a competitor to ChatGPT that is purely academic. Like, I still can't fully grasp it because of everything that you were just saying. Why, I mean... Uh, I can understand like my university. I mean, it's a small university, but all these huge universities, why couldn't they come together and, and exactly like what you're saying? Hey, there's plenty. There's millions of images out there that are public domain that so many people would be willing to create and and give uh, so that it would be locked within in dot edu. So that it would be purely academic on some level. Uh, again, I, I, I wish that there would be more push for that. And I think it would be really enhancing for, for all of academia and to especially make sure that it's international so that he can have all this type of flavor and understanding to, to really sort of bring all of us together. So I can really appreciate something like that. Um, would, would Alpaca, uh, Ruben, wasn't that Stanford students? Uh, would that be no, an Stanford. example? Would that be yes. an example? Yes, absolutely. And there are projects, for instance, around Bloom that have been similarly focused with academic institutions. But I think there's, you know, there's still a huge, huge range of possibilities. So absolutely, you've seen some of the large academic institutions or EU projects with Bloom uh, undertake this. But again, I, I think there, you know, I would love to see many, many more people in the pool because I have great respect for Stanford's AI department, don't make no mistake, but that's one perspective from one part of the world, one pool of students and professors right. that they right. draw from. And it's great that they're there. But again, the more people we get trying mm -hmm. out and playing with different versions of this, the richer it'll be. I mean, if you look for instance at image generative AI, we're now beginning to see some of the AI models have been trained at least at top tiers to start exploring different types of image representation, different types of, well, what if you don't train on the Lion data set, but on a different data set of images, do you start to get different perspectives and so on? So again, the more, you know, you need to get all of the different perspectives that don't just come from one part of the world or one set of parts of the world, if you will, to really start exploring what's possible here. Excellent, excellent. Uh Friends, I know we have two minutes. Can I say one thing really quickly? Please, what I'm concerned please. about is if we have limited resources of where we spend money mm -hmm. to improve education, mm -hmm. that we spend, we spend so much more on it, on the technology rather than on the people. That's what I'm concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. Always, always about the people. Um, we have one, oh shoot, we have so so little time and we have two questions. So this is a, this is a big question. And I'm wondering if each of you could just say 
one or two points in answer to it because it's a it's a great one and we need to come back to it this is from jenna linskins at ithaca college in new york uh and and i'm just wondering if you could just touch on this a little bit each of you um how is ai changing the way people will work in the professional world and then what's the impact on our students the instruction we provide today if you could just toss out a quick thing we need to circle back to this jenna but i'm just wondering if each of you could just say a little bit on that yeah, so I'll, I'll start off. Um, I'm sure some of one of you will talk about sort of computer programming, computer code. So I'm not going to address that part, but right. I've been trying to secretly observe other people uh, in different facets and to see how they use ChatGPT because it's generally ChatGPT. That's the big one, right? And it's funny because I see more and more people start to try and use it um, just to see if they're correct in what they're doing. So it's like mm. they want to mm. have some sort of co-pilot to, to make sure that they're doing it right or to give them a starting point. So again, and I, I know one person who's using it where this is their new search engine. They, they don't even go to Google first. They'll go to ChatGPT first. Then if they can't find it, if that won't help, then they'll go to Google. So that's a huge different shift. So I see a lot of people starting to incorporate it just in their overall process just to help them as a co-pilot. Thank you. Thank you. Great one. Yeah. Um, I think from my perspective, I, again, I wish we had more time on this one, but very briefly, we're going to see in terms of jobs and how AI interacts with jobs, the model that's very clearly uh, going to be dominant is going to be one of task replacement rather than job replacement. The thing about mm -hmm. that is that sounds great at the beginning because you say, oh, good, the jobs aren't going away. The tasks are getting replaced. I say, but yeah, but hold on. This is one of my areas of research into side effects, both good and bad. On the good side, AI, we have actually a new research paper that came out just a couple of days ago on the NBER that says that uh, workers who were at lower income levels, lower skill levels, et cetera, can perform and be rewarded as though they were at higher levels. And that AI has a leveling upwards effect if, here's the keyword, mm -hmm. if contextualized appropriately. Mm -hmm. within the context of the job. So that would be a positive side effect, shall we say, of having AI in this task space. But the negative side can also come in, and we're seeing it, I saw it going by in the chat, that this is coming in in some writing jobs, for instance, where some people are saying, oh, you know what? Uh, what I get out of chat GPT is good enough, so I'll keep you on, and you can still help me prune through this. But because the bulk of the work is now being done by chat GPT or whatever it is they're saying, I'm going to pay you less or I'm going to use right. less of your time, or I'm going to generalize. And that's a negative net effect. So it's neither, this is one of those cases where I come back to give people the tools so they can understand better, leverage the tool better, and advocate for themselves and say, hold on, if I am represented in whichever way it is, by a union, by a structure, by some type of managerial relation, whatever it is, so I can position myself and my workers and we can work together to define situations where you're looking at the better side effects rather than the more negative ones. So that, that's the quickest crazy I could make. Right do I have now. a minute? Yeah. You do. Just building, building on what Ruben said, I agree with everything you've said there. And I will just add a good contextualized example is translation. We have auto translation mm. now. It's pretty good mm -hmm. in a lot of languages. We still have human translations and it makes them a little bit more productive, but it doesn't replace them, but it does replace them in situations where you're not going to pay for a translator anyway. You're stuck in a country for two days that you don't know the language you need a translation, so you use mm -hmm. it. That's mm -hmm. helpful. But it doesn't do mm -hmm. professional translations. And when people use them for professional translations, they're really bad. Mm -hmm. So they still need uh, the humans in the loop. So I'm hoping that that will be the direction on the, on the text generation AI. Some other AI is doing stuff that humans can't do anyway. And those are the AIs that we should be really proud of and, and happy with. And, and making sure that they work well and thinking about how can AI support people with disabilities, for example. Uh, like yes. blind people navigate, Huge. like I was just talking Huge. to a blind student Absolutely. of mine, can you put a visual AI on a, on a walking stick, right? So. Mm. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you each, each of you for such really concise and, and yet rich answers to um, that fantastic question. Um, and thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, for that, uh, for that great question, Jenna, uh, we have to circle back to that. We we have we have shattered our time limit, um, and um, as a result, I, I have to wrap things up, which is which is enormously frustrating because this is terrific. Um, what I think is we need to have each of you back 
um, to do a kind of workshop version of the forum. Uh, so Maha to talk about faculty support, how to do it right. Ruben to walk us through using some of these DIY tools. Uh, and Brent to show us how to do this in terms of uh, AI literacy. So I'm just putting that out mm -hmm. there. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear that. But, but really quickly, in order to wrap things up, tell us quickly, how can we keep up with each of you? What's the best way to follow your work? Uh, Brent, starting off with you, your research and your book, is, uh, is Twitter the best way? Yeah, Twitter, definitely. Brent Anders, um, I'm on there. I'm, I'm putting out new information and I'm really big on trying to make infographics uh, to help people. Because again, the idea there is that to try and make the really complicated stuff simple and easy to understand through, through just a simple infographic. So I'm trying to do that. And I'm trying to also create some short videos so people can just sort of learn really quick some key things and then move on from there. And yeah, I'll be pushing information about my book uh, as soon as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. And Ruben? Uh, for my part, uh, probably a combination of Twitter and LinkedIn is a good place to be. Right now, I'm, I, I used to be very heavily Twitter-based these days for reasons that are uh, of common knowledge. Uh, Twitter is not quite the place it used to be, so I'm looking to rearrange that. And I'm also looking at a few other social tools, but the, the simplest way right now is uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you. And Maha, how can we and follow I you? Am, yeah, I am Bali underscore Maha on Twitter, and I couldn't leave because of this AI stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm also on Mastodon a little bit. But I think my blog, so blog.mahabali.me, I post a lot of incomplete thoughts about AI, and apparently they're helping people because we're all, nobody knows anything really. Maybe Brent knows a little bit. But <laughs> all of us are like really just experimenting and discovering together. So sometimes it's useful to ask questions more than give knowledge. I think and that's where I'm at. It's so crazy that you say that because you know I'm in my mind I'm like yeah we've been using AI for like two three years now right five months. Yes. Chat GPT has <laughs> only been around for about five months. It's, it's interesting. It's like uh, it's like pandemic time, um, but uh, <laughs> right. but reversed. Um, thank you, uh, but Maha, Ruben, Brent, thank you for being fantastic guests. Thank you. Uh, we're going to follow with each of you, and thank you very much. To, uh, to all participants, uh, thank you for uh, all of these comments, all these great questions. Uh, we're going to uh, post these up on a blog, uh, probably several posts, because there's a lot going on here. Um, I want to thank everybody for a fantastic, fantastic hour. Uh, to keep going with this, you've heard that everybody has their different handles and different places to find them. So please use the hashtag FTTE if you can in order to keep things going. Here is me on Mastodon and Twitter. Uh, if you'd like to dive into our previous sessions uh, on AI and on related topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you want to look into our upcoming sessions, which cover other parts of the future of higher education, from campus economics to sexual assault to faculty data, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. And thank you again for the opportunity to think together to collaboratively grapple with the future of higher education. I hope those of you in the Northern Hemisphere are enjoying spring as it gives way to summer. Above all, I hope you're all safe and take care. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.